Welcome back. We're now going to talk about some important questions that arise when you use uh, regression in, in real problems. So, well, is at least one of the predictors useful in predicting the response? Right? That's sort of the, the first order question. Is the, do the predictors on, on the whole have anything to, anything to say about the outcome? If not, we probably want to stop there. But given that there is some effect overall, which of the predictors are important? Are they all important or only some subset? How well does the model fit the data? Um, and also, given a set of predictive values, what response of that value should we predict? So what's our prediction of sales given a certain level of, of uh, advertising in the three modes? And how accurate is that prediction? So these are all things we can answer from the model. Well, at least one, two, and four, three we'll examine by looking at some alternative models. So the answer to the first question is at least one predictor useful. Does the model overall have any predictive value? We, we do, um, we, we look at the, the drop in training error. So this is the total sum of squares. Remember, if we just use the mean to predict, that's, that's the no predictor model. This is the, the, the residual sum of squares achieved using all three predictors. Um, and we can look at the drop, the present variance explained, which actually I've got here for, the, for that. We, we defined this earlier. Now it's 0.897. So it was about 0.6 something before. Now by adding the two more predictors, we've increased that to 0.897. So this says that we reduce the variance of sales around its mean by almost 90% by using these three predictors. That seems pretty impressive. To uh, quantify that in, in a more statistical way, we can form the F ratio, which is defined as follows. It's the drop in training error divided by P. P is the number of parameters we fit. Here it's three, right? The three kinds of advertising budgets. Divided by the mean squared residual. So N is the sample size, and we subtract off the number of parameters we fit, which is P plus one for the intercept. So statistical theory tells us that we can compute the statistic, and under the null hypothesis that there's no effect of any of the predictors, this will have a, an F distribution with P and N minus P minus 1 degrees of freedom. And again, there are tables of this, or your computer program will compute this for you. Um, the F statistic here is huge, okay? and its p-value, I haven't recorded here, but it's less than 0 0.0001. So this says what we kind of believe already looking at the at the previous tables and the graphs, that there's a strong effect here of the predictors on the outcome. They certainly have something to say about the, the outcome. Okay, what, when we fit linear regression models, one of the things we have to do is decide on what are the important variables to include in the model. By the way, this is not Rob anymore. Rob asked me to do this section because it's a little hard for him. Get in. So, the most direct approach is called all subsets or best subsets regression. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to compute the least squares fit for all the possible subsets of the variables and then choose between them based on some criterion that balances the, um, the training error with the model size. Now this might seem like a reasonable um, thing to do um, if you have a small number of variables but it gets really hard when the number of variables gets large. So if you've got p variables, there's two to the p subsets. And, you know, that two to the p grows exponentially with the number of variables. So, for example, when p is 40, there are over a billion models. Right? So we're talking about subsets like a model might have variable 1, 3, and 5 in it. That's a subset of size 3. And then a, another model might have a subset of size 4. And uh, um, with 40 variables, there's over a billion such models. So that clearly becomes cumbersome, um, searching through such a big model space. And so what we need instead is an automated approach that searches through um, for a, that and finds a subset of them. And so we'll describe uh, two commonly used approaches next. Forward selection is a very attractive approach um, because it's both tractable and it gives a, a good sequence of models. So this is how it works. You start with a null model. And the null model has no predictors in it, but it'll just have the intercept in it. 
and the intercept is the mean of y with no other variables in the model. And now what you do is you add variables one at a time. So the first variable you add, you do it as follows. You fit p simple linear regression models, each with one of the variables in and the intercept. And you look at each of them, and you add to the null model the variable that results in the lowest residual sum of squares. So basically, you just search through all the single variable models and pick the best one. Now, having picked that, you fix that variable in the model. And now you search through the re remaining p minus 1 variables again and find out which variable should be added to the variable you've already picked to best improve the residual sum of squares. And you continue in this, vari in this fashion, adding one variable at a time un until some stopping rule is satisfied. For example, in all the remaining variables have a, a p-value above some threshold. Now, this sounds like it might be computationally quite difficult as well, but it turns out it's not. There's some, there's some clever tricks you can use to, to do all these evaluations um, very efficiently. So, in a similar fashion, and, and this is if, if p is not too large, you can start from the other end. So, you start with a model with all the variables in the model, and now you're going to remove them one at a time. And this time, you're going to remove each, at each step, you're going to remove the variable that does the least damage to the model. In other words, you want to remove a variable that's got the least significance. And that you can actually find from looking at the, the, the t statistics for each of the um, variables and, and remove the one with the least significant t statistic. But now you've got a, a, a model with p minus 1 variables and you just repeat and you keep on going in that fashion again until you reach um, at some threshold that you've defined perhaps in, in terms of a, um, a p-value. So these are two approaches. They might seem somewhat ad hoc, but they're very effective. And later we'll discuss more systematic criteria for choosing an, an optimal member in the path of models produced by the either forward or stepwise model selection. Um, some of these criteria include something known as Mallow CP, Akaiki information criterion, AIC, uh, that's the abbreviation, and then BIC, which is Bayesian Information Criterion. These all sound like very important methods. They're named after important people, and they're very popular. And, and then there's something called adjusted R-squared. And one of our favorites is, is cross-validation, which you'll be learning about. We'll talk more about model selection in, 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 the later, um, in later sessions. Now, there's some other considerations in regression models um, that we haven't really touched on yet. And the one is qualitative predictors. So some, some variables are not quantitative, but qualitative. In other words, they don't take values on a continuous scale, but they take values in, in a discrete set. So we call them categorical predictors or factor variables. Um, we're going to see a, um, a matrix um, of data in the next slide. Um, it's a credit card data. In fact, I'll just take you there now. And so here's a bunch of variables um, on, on credit cards and, and ratings. And we see the, the current balance on the credit card, the age, number of cards, and so on. These are all quantitative variables. Now, in addition to these variables, we have we have some qualitative variables. So one of them is gender. So that takes on values male and female. Um, student. So the student status of the, of the card holder, whether they are a student or not. So these are qualitative values. Marital status. Say married, single, or divorced. There's no order really in those, those variables. They're just different categories. And likewise, ethnicity. Say Caucasian, African American, or Asian. Again, not no, in no way an ordered variable. So how do we deal with such qualitative predictors when we fit in linear regression models? So let's, let's consider our example on, on credit cards again. Imagine uh, investigating the difference in credit card balance between males and females, ig ignoring the other variables. So what we do is we recreate a new variable. Um, let's call it xi. And it's going to be, well, x, we call it x. And the ith value is going to be 1. 
if the ith person is a female and a zero if the ith person is a male. So we've got a, a, a name for such a variable, we call it a dummy variable. It's a created variable just to represent this categorical um, uh, feature. Okay? So for each value of i, we, we score an individual as 0 or 1, depending if they're female, male or female. And so now if we put such a variable in a model, um, let's say on its own, um, we've got the linear regression model with a coefficient for this dummy variable, um, xi. And let's see what it, it produces. Well, since xi takes on only two possible values, 0 or 1, it, the model is either going to be beta 0 plus beta 1 plus error if the person is female. And if the person is male, it's just going to be beta 0 plus error. So beta 1 is, is telling us um, the effect of being female versus the baseline, in this case, of uh, being male. And so that's how we deal with the categorical variable um, with just two levels. So here we see the results of the regression model using just the single um, variable gender and the dummy variable um, 0, 1, that, uh, the one representing female. And, and so we see the result. And uh, the coefficient's 19.73, um, but it's not significant. The p-value is 0.66, which is not significant. So uh, contrary to uh, popular wisdom, um, females don't generally have a higher credit card and ba uh, balance than males. Um, the number is 19.73, slightly higher, but it's not significant. So what do we do if you have a variable with more than two levels? So ethnicity is such a variable. Well, we just make more dummy variables. So ethnicity takes, uh, has three levels. So we'll make two dummy variables in this case, and we'll call them x1 and x2. And so xi1 is the, the value for the ith individual for vari dummy variable 1. We'll call it 1 if the, person's, the ith person's Asian, otherwise 0. And the second dummy variable will be 1 if the ith person is Caucasian, and 0 if not. And of course, if they're both zero, the person, the individual will be um, African-American. And so that's the general rule. If you've got a categorical variable with three levels, you make two dummy variables. If it's got two levels, you make one dummy variable. And if it's got k levels, you'll make k minus one dummy variables to represent each of those categories. So what does the model look like in this case? Well. We'll have a model now with two coefficients, one for each of these dummy variables. And let's look at the different cases. So if the person's Asian, they get the beta 1. If the person's um, Caucasian, they'll get the beta 2. And if the person's African American, they don't have beta 1 or beta 2, so the baseline beta 0 represents such a, an individual. And so what we see now is that beta 1 represents the difference between um, the baseline beta 0, which is African-American, and, and the difference between that individual and an Asian. So it's the additional effect being, uh, uh, for being an Asian, and beta 2 is the additional effect for being Caucasian. And as I said, there will be always one fewer dummy variable than the number of levels. So in this case, we call um, the the category African-American is known as the baseline level because it doesn't have a parameter representing it except beta zero. So here's the linear model. We've picked um, African-American as a baseline and so that actually determines which comparisons we make. So the coefficient minus 18.69 is comparing um, Asian to African-American and that's not significant and likewise um, the Caucasian to African-American, which is also not significant. Now, it turns out the choice of the baseline does not affect the fit of the model. The residual sum of, squ sum of squares would be the same no matter which um, category you chose as the baseline. But the contrasts um, would change because that would deter the, the picking the baseline determines which contrasts you make, and so the p-values potentially would change as you change the baseline. 